bell hooks. He tells us in All About Love. Rarely, if ever, is healing done in isolation. Healing is an act of communion or community care. And if healing is an act of communion, then the reparative way, the new way, the, the movement that is rigid and complex must be reparative, must be rooted in love, and must be embodied as love. Breathe in love. Let's breathe in some love and breathe out love. Feel that. Let it settle. So I must ask a question based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy. What do we want the world to look like in seven generations? Write that down. Remember it. What do we want the world to look like in seven generations? It's a philosophy and a principle that the decisions we make today should make a positive impact seven generations ahead. It should result in a sustainable world in the world of our indigenous siblings, the world that was cultivated before the lie of Christopher Columbus. Speaking of the Iroquois, I have to name that I am speaking to all of you on stolen land. This is Chumash land. While it's called El Segundo, I believe, I honor it as Chumash land, as Tongva land, because myself as a neurodivergent black woman whose ancestors were sold out in the name of capitalism, I have a responsibility to tell the truth. We all have a responsibility to be truth tellers and truth seekers. Connecting to the spirit of my truth from my own ancestors, from the Akan tribe of Ghana, I also practiced Sankofa, which is an ideology that we look ahead and our feet move forward but we have to look back to pull out the lessons we must learn. I practice the spirit of Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. The path to collective liberation is the path to heal your way, actually. Heal my way, no, actually, heal our way forward to build the repair of the future. That is the future of the new way. It's rooted in the indigenous wisdom that we are the conduits of Mother Earth and we are collective community. But see, in a matrix of oppression, that's Patricia Hill Collins, dominated by imperial, capitalist, white supremacist, ableist patriarchy, we are taught as young children. We are what we produce. And so we perform, we consume, and we caretake everyone else except for ourselves. But we can't give what we don't have, so if the work is rooted in love, do we really love ourselves enough to really show up for other people? Because until we collectively liberate ourselves, can we really liberate others? You know, a really good, dear mentor, friend of mine, TED Talker, her name is Mitty. She's a world-renowned photographer for National Geographic, a scuba diver. I love scuba diving, by the way. You know, she says that we seek outside of ourselves because we all lack a sense of enoughness. We don't feel like we have enough, which is why we consume and we buy and we spend, because we lack that sense of enoughness. And so that lack is a wound. And as Dr. Edward Duran says, an indigenous psychiatrist, it's a soul wound. And so the path towards collective liberation is reclaiming the soul wound individually so we can show up for collective liberation. So I want to play a little game. I want to tell you guys a little story. I want to talk about, let's do Sankofa, right? Remember what I said? Stepping forward and looking back? Let's, let's do this. When I was... 17 years old, I met a guy. I was introduced to this guy, really great guy. And I was like, oh my God, I love this guy. He's so amazing. I remember it was Valentine's Day and his birthday. So I took my check from Macy's. 
and I bought him his favorite cologne. I was like, I'm going to give this to him. And I gave it to him. And then I never heard from him again. <laughs> to this day, I don't know if it was my fault, his fault. I was 17, right? So when I was 35, I had my three kids. My youngest, she was in a stroller. I was going to do a project called, I'm just going to call it sidewalk listening. And I had my kids, and I'm walking, and I get to Taco Bell, and I look, and I feel the energy. I felt it, because you know when you love somebody, you still feel the connection, because we're conduits. So I'm up there, I look, and I looked at him. He's talking on the phone in Spanish, and I'm like, no, that's not him. So I looked away, and I just put my head down walked away. It was really odd the rest of the night. I saw him a couple times. I was like, OK. Saw him like a year later at a table with a friend, and I was real awkward, quiet, shy. OK. Then I saw him when I was 38, 37. He added me on Facebook. My Facebook status said at that time, when the past calls don't answer, it has nothing new to say. <laughs> but it wasn't for him, so he sent me a message. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's not about you. You know, it's my ex, you know, all that. And so we started talking again. Remember, I was 17. And we started talking again at 37 at the same time. February, which was the same time I gave him the cologne, and we don't know what happened. <laughs> but throughout that time, you know, we were talking. I was sick. He brought me soup. I didn't even make the connection that if a guy buys you soup, he likes you. So I was like, oh, that's so sweet. But then George Floyd gets murdered. And let me give you a preface. He didn't know what I did. He wasn't into my work. He didn't even ask me what I did for a living. He didn't care. George Floyd was murdered, and I was catapulted into fame. I got a blue check on social media. <laughs> you couldn't tell me nothing. <laughs> and he was watching me online, like, do my thing. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, this is my work. I'm a blue check. I'm ordained. I'm a minister. I'm supposed to be doing these things this way. He was like, no, that is not you. You are better than this. You have a calling higher than this. And the kids, I just buy them things so, you know, I could just be working all the time. Mentally enslaved to the system of capitalism because the blue check and the paycheck made me feel like I was the shit. <laughs> the blue check and the paycheck was my payout to pay my family to let me do what I wanted to do, to be disconnected, to show up for everyone else except for myself. It was my husband who says, that's not you. And in that moment, when I had to write a book, <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm really in this mental enslavement. I don't have a, the sense of enoughness because I'm performing for a paycheck. I'm emotionally extorting white people, specifically emotional extortion, for a paycheck. Is it part of my calling to help people heal their, way, heal their way forward? Absolutely. But not at the cost of emotional extortion. Not at the cost of the blue check and the paycheck, and especially not at the cost to demean myself and to put my family on the back burner. And so like you, this may sound familiar, the idea that I'm performing, I'm producing, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm showing up for everybody else, but you may not have the sense of enoughness like me. So it tells me that we're hurt, we're fragmented, we're born into this society where things are set and all we know to do is perform and produce, consume, and that's it. Because if we're all under the lens of oppression, that means that we all have the same enslaved mind and an enslaved mind can't see liberation for itself or others. You know, the matrix of oppression keeps us all prisoners of our mind. And going back, using Sankofa as the teacher, I thought I was an expert. But see, the problem with expert culture is that it ruins our sense of enoughness. 
If we all think we're experts, how do we really heal? Because you can't heal if you think you're an expert because you think you got your shit together. And none of us do. None of us. But see, it's the fear of us owning that we don't know that keeps us on the hamster wheel of performance that allows us to think that we do. But the moment that you're ready to step into your healing and say, I know nothing. That is the first step in healing. Not your way, not my way, but our way forward. You know, I've had to learn that I really want to be free And a good friend of mine, Tina Strawn, has a book coming out called Are We Free Yet? And it takes me to this space as I'm reading it, like I'm not free. I still struggle with the mental enslavement. But I know on the path of healing my way forward, it's not about being an expert or performing for any of you. It's really about understanding that freedom is possible if I just take the step and believe. And if I allow myself to be seen, heard, and healed in community. To not let shame be the catalyst of fear, but let shame be the teacher, because again, the great ancestor, Bell Hooks, taught me through her work that shame is one of the deepest tools of imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist, ableist patriarchy, because shame produces trauma, and trauma often produces paralysis, which leaves all of us in a state of analysis paralysis, overanalyzing the next move before we have the belief enough to take it, or the hope, because that's what's required. You know, the path of liberation means that we ask for forgiveness, understanding, I love you, Bell Hooks, (laughs) that forgiveness and compassion are linked, that we must believe in our own capacity to grow, heal, and change, hold ourselves accountable and each other so that we can grow. It's not about perfection. It's not about getting it right because we got to get it wrong. It is the failure. It is the fear. It is moving with the fear of getting it wrong that we'll get it right. It's allowing that fear to be the catalyst of change. You know, a lot of people in the activism space are burn it down and let's turn it down. We've been saying burn it down since the 60s. Ain't nothing got burnt down. (laughs) So maybe it's not burn it down. Maybe it's repair the future. You know, my friend Courtney, she has an Instagram called Sacred Identity. She says, activism work is rehumanizing work. So maybe the goal isn't to burn it down, it's to rehumanize ourselves, to see ourselves in each other as that catalyst of growth. It's divorcing the current social justice industrial complex because it's turned into an industry where everyone's getting blue checks and paychecks. <laughs> But we're not talking about divorcing what I call, shout out to Dr. King, my own triple evils of politics, religion, and the R word, racism. Because those are the three things that keep us divided. And we cannot connect if we're always divided. So collective liberation is trusting the way that we get to our sense of enoughness by utilizing the spirit of Sankofa to say, I see you and you see me and we are in existence together. This is not demeaning yourself to show up for others. It's taking ownership of yourself to walk toward healing. And not healing in that like super woo, like capitalist yoga space where it's like, oh, I'm going to go get Starbucks and get my yoga mat. It's ownership. It's looking at yourself in the mirror. It's not me saying, hey, you white lady, you're this, this and that. Because what I see in this white woman is what I saw in myself when I couldn't heal. What I wouldn't take the first step because the social justice industrial complex teaches us to other. It doesn't teach us in Ubuntu. It teaches us my three triple evils, separation. The path to healing our way forward is for us to be living conduits to connect to the new earth, the new way, the way that our indigenous siblings and elders are trying to remind us to walk, to disconnect from human technology and go internal to our internal wisdom, to our internal technology, to find ourselves to show up for each other. Because you cannot show up for someone if you don't know yourself or love yourself. The path of collective liberation is rooted in love. And my best friend and ancestor says that love is care, commitment, knowledge, responsibility, 
and respect. And you have to have that for you first and then the collective. The reparative future is grounded in love. It's grounded in healing our way forward. And I model that because when I walk and heal my way forward, it gives you permission to heal your way forward and then we can heal our way forward towards collective liberation. Thank you.